I'm proud to demonstrate the so-called key points in this rubber model. This is a very nice uh, Swiss rubber model that was uh, done. It's done in Seoul there, but it's, it's done out of an actual brain. You know, Yasser Gil that started doing this. So you can get an hemisphere or a cerebellum, a brainstem, whatever. So it's, it's pretty much, it's exactly like a, an actual brain. Has the ver some variations. And I'll try to show the so-called key points here, the relationships with the skulls that I brought here. It's a plastic, but it's a very good uh, skull. Eduardo is cleaning a couple of uh, brains that we can go there and, and check. So for you to for practice to recognize the soul side and the, so, the so-called key points as well. Okay, so let's start here in the Sylvan Fisher. You, you have the Sylvan Fisher, and you have an enlargement of the Sylvan Fisher here. And you have this beautiful you here. So of course this beautiful you is the pars opercularis, the opercular part. The pars triangularis, it's, it's not well, uh, it doesn't resemble a triangle here, but it's all this retracted convolution here. Again, pars triangularis, pars opercularis, and each other is a concept. It's not very well uh, 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 always constant. But anyway, I would say this is presental sulcus ending inside the pars opercularis. This is anterior ascending, and this is horizontal. So this is pars triangularis here, okay? And this is pars orbitalis that is resting in the orbit right here. Okay, just posterior to the pars opercularis, of course you would have the precentral gyrus and postcentral gyrus, and the central sulcus here. This is the point where the central sulcus would project into the uh, sylvan fissure, what we call inferior orlandic point. This is the posterior sylvan point, okay? And of course, you have this posterior ascending branch and a very variable descending branch, which is more constant is you always have an, a, a posterior ascending branch. And the supramarginal gyrus, of course, goes around this posterior ascending branch, and supramarginal gyrus is also this region that continues with the superior temporal gyrus. So this part belongs also to the supramarginal gyrus. It's all this region here that continues as the supramarginal gyrus. Down here we have the superior temporal sulcus. Superior temporal sulcus is very, very deep, as you can see here. You have a small interruption here, but usually it's a continuous sulcus, and it ends posterior to the posterior sylvan point. Okay, I forgot to show you here the Heschel gyrus. If we open here, you can see the Heschel gyrus right here. And you can see that the post-central gyrus is always sitting in the Heschel gyrus, always sitting in the Heschel gyrus. So here inside the fissure, you have the polar plane that is oblique, easy to open the fissure here. You always start in the anterior serum point. And then you have, you have the, you, and you can see even this, this specimen here, you can see this prominence here, which is the Heschel gyrus. You see the Heschel gyrus? If you go here, you're gonna get into, into the atrium. And this is all temporal plane, temporal plane here. The supramarginal gyrus is resting in the temporal plane, and the postcentral gyrus is resting over the Heschel gyrus. But coming back to the superior temporal sulcus, superior temporal sulcus ends posterior to the posterior sylvan point. So this is supramarginal gyrus, so everything that is posterior, this is angular, this is angular. So when the, um, the superior temporal sulcus ends, you have an ascending branch that separates the supramarginal from the angular. And you have a distal one that here is very small that gets inside the angular. And you have another descending one, which is very variable. So supramarginal gyrus and just posterior, the angular gyrus. In this specimen, we don't have a very well-defined interparietal sulcus, but I can see a very deep sulcus here, and then you have an interruption, which you know that interparietal sulcus would be here. It's interrupted, big interruption here, but it continues with the interoccipital here. But this segment that is just next to the postcentral this is the post-central. This, this area is the meeting point between them. It's the closest point to the atrium. If we see here, you're gonna see it's closest point to the atrium. 
If we come to the mesial side, you have the cingulate gyrus, the callosal sulco that is in between the cingulate gyrus and the corpus callosum, and above the cingulate gyrus, you have the cingulate sulcus. Cingulate sulcus is very deep at this, deep, at, at this posterior part. Always ascends and had this terminal ascending part of the cingulate sulcus. Everything that is anterior is paracentral lobule. So you see, all this is paracentral lobule in this case. This is ascending posterior. I'm sorry, you have to tell me I'm, when it's not showing up. This is ascending part of the cingulate sulcus. This is paracentral sulcus. And this is everything paracentral lobule. Anterior to the paracentral sulcus, you're going to have the superior frontal gyrus. Superior frontal gyrus is continuous with the rectus gyrus. Always continuous with the rectus gyrus. Rectus gyrus is delineated superiorly by the superior hostral sulcus, here, superior hostral sulcus, and harbors inside the inferior hostral sulcus. And around the superior hostal sulcus, where it ends the superior hostal sulcus, you have the cingulate pole. The cingulate pole is this connection that you have between the cingulate gyrus and the rectus gyrus. It's always there, a beautiful, another small beautiful you. Posterior to the cingulate pole, you have the para olfactory area of Broca, where you have a very, you see here the, the, the anterior commissure. Just anterior to the anterior commissure, you're gonna have the paraterminal gyrus, and then posterior part of factory and anterior part of factory. You have three small gyri here. And this is referred to as the, being the septal region. This is septal region. We're seeing here the thalamus. Of course, this is foramia Monroe. This is the fornix, okay? Here, posterior, you have the crur of the fornix. The crur of the fornix here. And then you have the body of the fornix that detached from the thalamus and gets inside the brain. And this enlargement of the choroidal fissure is the foramen moro. You see very well the aqueduct here, the aqueduct, and you see that you have a very nice depression always, very evident depression that comes from the foramen of Monroe until the opening of the aqueduct. This is the hypothalamic sulcus. So everything superior to this is thalamus. Everything inferior to this is hypothalamus. Here you can see the mammillary body. And up here you would be having the chiasm here, not seen very well. Everything that is anterior to the mammillary body is hypothalamus. Everything that is posterior to the mammillary body is midbrain. Okay? So this is the whole floor of the third ventricle. Half, posterior half is midbrain. Anterior half, which is anterior to the mammillary body, is hypothalamus. Hypothalamic sulcus. This is all the lateral wall of the third ventricle. So lateral wall of the third ventricle has two thirds, upper two thirds is thalamus, lower third is hypothalamus. In the roof of the, uh, of the, third, of, of the third ventricle, of course you have the fornix, I already talked about, and this is the medullary tree of thalamus, this bridge, this ridge here. It ends at the abenula. Abenula is a small nucleus that you have here. And in between the stria medullary thalamae and the fornix, all this, this area here is the roof of the third ventricle. And inside here, you have the, you have the, 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 the vellum interpositon cistern that goes from the Voramio Monroe until the pineal cistern posterior here. Inside the vellum interpositon cistern, you have both internal cerebral veins and you have the both post posterior medial choroidal arteries. This is all within the third ventricle roof. Indeed, you have two membranes, an upper membrane, that is the superior telechoroidea, and then you have an inferior and the inferior telechoroidea. The, the so-called velointerposton system is in between these two telechoroidea, the superior one attached to the fornix and the inferior one attached to the stria medullaris thalami. Everything that is inside here is inside the development interposton system. But come back into, coming back to the sulcus, so you have here the very deep ascending distal ascending portion of the cingulate sulcus. Everything that is anterior is paracentral lobule. Here you see very well the calcan fissure. This is calcan fissure. 
This is calcium fissure. You see, it's very deep. Calcium fissure is very deep. This triangular convolution here is the cuneus in between the parietoccipital sulcus and the distal part, distal half of the calcium fissure. Anterior to the cuneus, you have the precuneus. Precuneus is always quadrangular this way. And then down here, you have the isthmus of the cingulate. Okay, the isthmus of the cingulate. Now, in the occipital region, in, in humans, it's not very well defined, but you're always going to see the sulcus here and a vertical gyrus, longitudinal gyrus, is vertical here. This is referred to as being the superior occipital gyrus. Inferior occipital gyrus is the gyrus that is longitudinal down here, and the region in between, it's called middle occipital gyrus, not very well defined. Now, this superior occipital gyrus is the same piece of brain as the cuneus. When you see here from the mesial side, you call it cuneus. When you see here, you call it occipital superior gyrus, but it's the same piece of brain. The same thing here, you have interparietal sulcus here. Everything that is inferior is inferior parietal lobule, namely the supramarginal and the angular gyrus. And superior to the supramarginal, to the, to the interparietal sulcus, you have the superior parietal lobule. And superior parietal lobule is the same piece of brain as the precuneus. When you see in the medial surface, you call precuneus. When you see up here in the superolateral surface of the brain, you call superior parietal lobule. Coming back from the sulco key points, you see this very deep sulcus. So this is, this is the post-central sulcus, post-central sulcus. This enlargement here is where the interparietal sulcus that here is interrupted, but reaches, this is a segment here of the imparietal sulcus, this point is the transition point between interparietal and postcentral. This is the closest point to, 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 to the atrium. Well, and when, when you look along the, silver, the, the, the interbispheric fissure, you're seeing this beautiful U here. This beautiful U is the, 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 the paracentral lobule. So this is central sulcus. You see the central sulcus is coming here. It's going down here. And ends projecting in the fissure. In this case, the subcentral gyrus is inside the fissure here. It's inside the fissure. The sub this is subcentral gyrus. Again, the inferior orlandic point is projection of the central sulcus in the sylvan fissure. And the superior orlandic point is this point of this beautiful U here in the interhemispheric fissure. Opistocranium corresponds to the most distal aspect of the occipital pole, most posterior one, and it, it corresponds to the end of the calcarine fissure and to the base of the cuneus. Then you can come and take a look yourselves here, but let me show in the skull where are these things. Can we maybe put it more superior in, in order to have a, a bigger view? I think we already have, yeah, okay. Where do you release it? Okay. Okay, of course, this is the bregma. This is coronal suture. This is coronal suture. This is sagittal suture. Nasium right here. In the adult, if you take the, the distance from the nasium to the bregma, is 12 to 14 centimeters. And then from the bregma to the lambda, more, 13, more 12 to 13 centimeters. Of course, lambda is the sagittal suture together with the lambdoid sutures here. Well, when we come to this region here, you can have the suture, the sutures have this H format here, okay? And this, the bregma is a point the aeolium is a point. Everybody, all the names I'm giving is a point. The only thing that's not a point is pterium. Pterium is this region here. That's why it's called pterional craniotomy, because pterional craniotomy goes exactly, you have to remove the sphenoid wing here, the upper the lateral part of the sphenoid wing, okay? So 
This pterium region has an H shape. You have the coronal suture coming here. This suture here is called frontosphenoidal suture. This suture from here to here is called the sphenoidal temporal suture. And this suture here is the parietosphenoidal suture. You just remember the name of the bones and you identify the sutures, okay? So the squamous suture is beginning at this point, goes up and then comes down. The anterior sylvan point, where you have the pars triangularis more retracted, is right here in the beginning of the squamous suture. So at this point, you have the pars triangularis more retracted, and you have the pars opercularis harboring the precentral sulcus here. This is anterior sylvan point. Remember that you did palpate your preauricular depression, and if you take four centimeters in the adult, you're gonna be at the highest part of the squamous suture. This is inferior orlandic point, where the central sulcus project into the squamous suture. Broca had shown that the, sup the, the superior orlandic point, where the central sulcus meets the interhemispheric fissure, hence where you have the paracentral lobule, the central sulcus reaches the interhemispheric fissure five centimeters posterior to the bregma five centimeters posterior to the brain. So here you're gonna have the paracentral lobule. Remember that the paracentral lobule is already sitting at the level of the atrium. If we go to parietal region, you're seeing here the parietal tuberosity. Okay, this is the most prominent point of parietal bossa. This, is, this bossa here is called parietal tuberosity or parietal bossa. The most prominent point, which is this point, Broca called Eurium. Eurium in Greek, in Greek means the far, most far away. Right underneath the Eurium, you have the anterior half of the supramarginal gyrus. Now, if we come from the, in the lambda, you remember that in the lambda, you have the incisure, which is the depth of the parietal occipital sulcus, right here, no error, right here. If you take five centimeters anteriorly and six centimeters lateral, you're going to get to a region, you're going to get to a region where the intraparietal sulcus is turning into the post-central sulcus. So inferior to the intraparietal sulcus, this is all inferior parietal lobule. Anterior, you have the supramarginal gyrus and posterior, you have the angular gyrus. And superior to it, you have the superior parietal lobule that along the interhemispheric fissure is continuous with the precuneus. Opistocranium is the most prominent point of the occipital bossa. And right here you have the end of the calcan fissure. So in between the opistocranium and the lambda, where you have the parietal occipital sulcus, of course you have the cuneus. So the cuneus is right here. In between the cuneus, the, 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 the opistocranium and the inion, you're gonna have the projection of the lingual gyrus. So just by seeing this, you can know where the convolutions are. 